Well, we open our Bibles again at the book of Revelation. <clears throat> of necessity, we've had to be very selective in the passages we've looked at from this uh, final book of the New Testament. If you were here on the first night, we were looking at chapters 4 and 5 and focused very specifically then around that picture of the Lamb. Then last night, uh, we were looking at chapter 13 and the uh, uh, picture of the beast. Two different uh, zoological kind of metaphors which uh, John uses to contrast with one another. We've got a contrast uh, tonight, too. A contrast this time not between two uh, animal metaphors, but between two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. Uh, that means we're going to have to scan quite a large part of the latter chapters of the book. So we're going to be a bit ambitious and uh, cast our eye right the way from verse uh, 17 right the way through to chapter 22. But don't worry, we're not going to look at every verse in all that section. But to set our minds in the right gear for our study, I want to read to you a section from chapter 19. This lies right at the heart of those closing chapters. I'm going to read chapter 19, verses 11 to 16. Let's hear God's word together. I saw a heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like, are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Just out of interest, how many uh, folk here were actually uh, around on the first VE day and can just about remember it? Oh, you see a surprising number. You see, that just makes me feel very young. Uh, I wasn't quite born on VE day. I still had a year before my mother received that joyful news. So I have no memory of it at all. But I would have quite liked to have been there. It must have been rather exciting to be there. There are certain days, aren't there, which you always do remember. You remember what you were doing, where you were on that particular day. I expect VE days like that for the people who were around. It was one of those days, of course, when you could look back. Look back not just over the six years of the war, but the, the period before that, when uh, Hitler and his forces had been making those, those terrible territorial strikes into the heart of, of Europe. People no doubt could remember many tears, a great deal of loss and tragedy in their lives. But it wasn't just a day for looking backward, surely, was it? That first VE day was a great day of celebration. It was a day when people were looking forward with a great sigh of relief. The war was over. Now they could start making plans for a new beginning a better kind of society. I suppose the cynic might be forgiven for saying that the 50 years since have not produced the kind of society that most people were dreaming of, I guess, in May 1945. But I'm sure that's how people felt about it then. Looking back, looking forward. Well, these last chapters of the book of Revelation are a bit like that. And chapter 19 stands on the watershed. Here is God's V.E. day. Here is a picture for us in these verses we've just read of the triumphant Christ returning in glory. No longer the suffering lamb. Now he has armies on his side. He comes to conquer. He comes to rule. He comes to subdue every force of evil. 
and to be enthroned as the one and only King and Lord. Looking back from that great VE day to come, that day of his victory, John sees the fall of the earthly power which preceded him. He calls it Babylon, the city of Babylon, a great city. As he looks forward from that VE day into the future, he sees another city paralleling Babylon in a way, just as the lamb and the beast parallel one another. But this is a beautiful city, New Jerusalem. What I want us to do then tonight is to just stand on the watershed of Christ's return, his VE day in Revelation 19, look back to chapter 17 and 18 at Babylon that has fallen, and look forward to the new Jerusalem which is to come. Let's start then with that backward look. And if you've got your Bible, just turn back a page to chapter 17, verses 3 to 5 where this Babylon is introduced to us. Verse 3, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. Well, remember that beast, don't we? We were introduced to it in chapter 13. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And this title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Looking back then, John sees Babylon, this epitome of godless civilization depicted as a coarse and brazen prostitute. There is a school of thought, some of you may be aware of it, that wants to identify Babylon with apostate religion. Uh, Martin Luther rather popularized that line of interpretation with a book he wrote many years ago called uh, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. He interpreted Babylon as, uh, as Roman Catholicism in the Middle Ages. The, uh, the grounds on which that sort of line is argued, of course, is that in the Old Testament, apostate Israel, Israel when she wandered away from God, was often likened to an adulterous wife who was being unfaithful to her covenant, to her true husband, Jehovah. So it's argued what we have in this loose woman of Babylon is a similar picture of corruption and idolatry in the church in the last days. But I really don't think that line of interpretation can be justified. Uh, you see, if you look carefully at what's said here about this woman and the city that she represents, she's not actually accused of adultery, but of sexual immorality, of fornication, to use the old-fashioned word. She's not breaking any covenant with God. There's nothing to suggest she's ever had a relationship with God. Her sin is not infidelity, but prostitution. That's the word John uses the prostitution of wealth and talent in the service of a, of a secular culture, a godless culture. There's no question, I think, that for John, this woman represents Rome. If the beast that we were looking at last night represents the Roman emperor, the Roman state, this woman represents Roman culture, the city of Rome itself, the civilization that was around. We're left with little room for uncertainty about that down in verse 9 of chapter uh, 17 where uh, uh, we spe he speaks of uh, this woman as sitting on seven hills. Now, any of you who know your history will know that the city of Rome sat on seven hills. It was a well-known Latin uh, uh, description of Rome. Indeed, it's not impossible that this analogy of a prostitute was suggested to John's mind not by any uh, connection with the Old Testament idea of an adulterous Israel, but rather was suggested to him by the debauched and immoral behavior of the aristocratic women of Rome. Women like uh, Valeria Messalina, the wife of the Emperor Claudius, for instance, who was 
uh, reputed to have served incognito in the city's brothels for uh, the sexual thrill of it. So we're not dealing here with um, apostate religion. If that's the way you've read the book of uh, Revelation in the past, forgive me, but I suggest you make a far stronger case for saying what we're looking at here is a secular culture, a godless culture, a culture which has no interest in God, just as ancient Rome was. You may want to say, well, if Babylon's a pseudonym for Rome, well, why doesn't, um, why doesn't um, John just call it Rome? Why does he call it Babylon and confuse us all? Well, part of that was probably political prudence, you see. The Christians were being persecuted. To go around saying that Rome was going to fall was not a very safe thing to go around saying. You can imagine that, can't you? So it was in the interest of the Christians to find some kind of pseudonym for Rome whereby they could say what they wanted to say about Rome without uh, uh, inviting uh, extra hostility to that which they were already experiencing. The code word Babylon, actually there's quite a lot of evidence, even in the New Testament, that uh, the Christians like to think of themselves as, as uh, exiles. Just as the Jews were exiled in Babylon at one period in the Old Testament, the early Christians like to think of themselves as exiles, living in a world where they don't feel at home, waiting to return to where they really belong, to Jerusalem. More than that, though, more than the fact that Babylon was a useful sort of code name for the Roman Empire, for these Jews, for these Christians who felt they didn't really belong in Rome, more than that, there is, I think, the purpose of the Holy Spirit here. Because, of course, Babylon isn't just Rome. John is writing a book here for the church in every age, not just for the church in the first century. And just as we saw last night that the beast... In, Roman, in Revelation 13, isn't just the Roman emperor. The beast represents every form of godless tyranny that the world has ever known, a composite monster. In the same way, this city, which um, John is talking about here, is a composite city. It represents godless culture in every age, not just the Roman Empire. In fact, uh, if you were to look carefully with your... Um, with your concordance at these two chapters, 17 and 18, you'd find evidence for that because uh, John actually draws his imagery in these two chapters as he describes Babylon from very many different Old Testament sources. We find quotes, for instance, from the book of Nahum that originally applied to the great pagan city of Nineveh. We find quotes from the book of Ezekiel that originally applied to the great pagan city of Tyre. You can find allusions to Genesis, which originally applied to the great pagan city of Sodom. And of course, you can find references to the prophecy of Isaiah that originally applied to the literal Babylon, ancient Babylon. So this city we're talking about here is not one city, it's all cities. John calls her Babylon not to imply that World War III is going to be fought in southern Iraq, this is a symbol for that godless culture with which the church has had to uh, engage in every generation and still today and will right up to the end, perhaps with unprecedented intensity as the end draws closer. What is this city like then, this depraved culture of Babylon? What's it like? We could talk about lots of things. We could talk about its vast international influence John speaks about that in verse 15. The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. A world system that infatuates the nations. That's how John describes uh, this, uh, this city. Infatuates her in, uh, them in a way that, uh, that this uh, prostitute entices uh, them. They are fascinated by her. She weaves a magic spell around them. We could speak, too, of the moral decadence in this city, this culture, for John speaks about that, too. But I think for us, sitting here in 1995, the key thing to notice about this great city of Babylon, which John looks back to from the perspective of Jesus' return, his VE day, the key thing to notice about it is this. It is a culture of enormous materialistic 
affluence. Look at chapter 18, verses 11 and 13, to, uh, to get a flavor for that. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of what? Of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. See, what this uh, coarse prostitute lacks in natural beauty, she makes up for in artificial glamour. John is here giving us a catalogue of the expensive cosmetics with which she seeks to titivate herself. The precious stones and pearls, the purple and scarlet in which she's dressed in 17 verse 4. It's an economy based on luxury goods. He's painting a picture here of a culture where extravagance is admired. And that, I say, is very relevant to you and me. I expect some of you are aware that uh, if you were to go back 20 years ago and read books in the average Christian bookshop on Book of Revelation, many of them would have identified Babylon as communism. Many of them would have um, uh, regarded the beast on which the woman sits as uh, the red menace. Well, he is colored scarlet after all. What is Babylon, they would say, but the pervert, pervasive influence of international Marxism wooing the whole world to its side before the end comes? But of course, that description doesn't fit, doesn't it? Indeed, I mean, recent events in the USSR have rendered it it's, it's, um, all the more obviously wrong. But it was wrong even before the USSR fell, because this Babylon which John is depicting for us here has far more in common with the capitalist West than it has ever had with the socialist East. Well, let's just look at this list of merchandise. You won't find any of that in any shop in Moscow, I can tell you. But it does sound extraordinary like a trip down Oxford Street in London, doesn't it? Gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, what's this but Ratners and Samuels, diamonds are forever. Fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, oh, this is Liberties, this is River Island. Every kind of ivory, wood, bronze. Oh, well, this is the antique trade. These are the gift shops. This is Sotheby's. Cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense. Well, you know, every department store always confronts you the moment you walk in with Fabergé and Chanel, doesn't it? <laughs> Wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep. This is Selfridge's delicatessen. Horses and carriages? Well, of course. That's the Bond Street car showrooms, isn't it? The Mayfair branch of the Rolls-Royce Company. And the bodies and souls of men? We call that the job center these days. In Roman society, they called it the slave market. For you see, in Babylon, everything is bought and sold. Even human labor is thought of as a commodity to be bought and sold. The people who get rich in Babylon are the people who get rich out of trade. They're the ones who bemoan her passing, says John. The businessmen who sell the stuff, the merchants of the earth, will weep and mourn, he says. The shipping companies who import it, verse 17. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who learn their living from the sea will stand far off and when they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? And they will throw dust on their heads with weeping and mourning and cry, whoa, whoa, O oh great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. The businessmen the shipping companies, and, of course, the governments who tax all this trade, verse 9. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, 
see the smoke of her burning. They will weep and mourn over her too, terrified at her torment. They will stand for off and cry, Whoa, whoa, oh great city, oh Babylon, city of power. In Babylon, you see, the emphasis is not on productivity, but on selling. Babylon is the epitome of a market economy. She is the unacceptable face of capitalism in all its gaudy affluence and thinly veiled cruelty. Her materialism isn't the austere, ideological materialism of communism. It's the self-indulgent, covetous materialism of consumerism. Look at verse 23 again, halfway down. Your merchants were the world's great men. Do you notice that? Not her scientists, not her generals, not even her politicians. Her merchants were the world's great men. They were the people who had the biggest houses, the biggest cars. They were the people people admired most, the moguls of commerce and finance. It's an astonishing insight by John, isn't it? That at the end of the age, it will not be the power of the silicon chip. It will not be the power of the nuclear reactor. At the end of the age, the biggest power on earth will be the power of money. The beast's last tyranny will be a commercial empire. And that's why I say this is a very, very disturbing observation for us. For you see, Babylon is not Moscow, but she could be London. She's not Peking, but she could be Hong Kong. She's not Havana, but she could be New York. Babylon is a city of materialistic affluence, altogether too much like the very kinds of cities we are building now in the West. The West, which since the fall of the communist bloc, is now dominant the world over. The ideology of which is spreading from one end of the globe to the other without anything now to limit it or control it or to hinder it. And says John, that Babylon, for all its affluence and power and international prestige in the last days, is a doomed city. See how he begins chapter 18? I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Something very dramatic about this fall. Dramatic, first of all, because of its suddenness. Do you notice that... Uh, we're told several times, in a single hour, in a single day. Verse 10 of chapter 18, in one hour your doom has come. Verse 19 of chapter 18, in one hour she has been brought to ruin. John seems convinced that when this culture collapses, it will be catastrophic. It will not be a slow decline. last few years, we've had a few warning signs of that sort, haven't we? A few warning signs of just how precariously our world economy is balanced. Everything may feel so prosperous. But the pattern of mutual dependency in economics these days is so complicated, so interwoven, it's all like a house of cards. And increasingly, the people who are at the heart of it, the financial dealers, the captains of industry, they are not the men of integrity the men of incorruptibility they used to be, are they? See, more and more signs of just how, how little a puff of wind would be needed, perhaps to bring the whole thing toppling down. John says that's how it will be. Dramatic in its suddenness, dramatic in its irony, because John suggests, if you look at the end of chapter 17, that um, Babylon will not be destroyed by some supernatural bolt from heaven. She will implode. The seeds of her own destruction are there. She destroys herself from within. In some kind of uh, 
civil war maybe, or some kind of uh, internal collapse at any rate. The seeds of her own self-destruction are there in her internal moral decadence. That is John's verdict. Babylon is a doomed city. Suddenly, when no one is expecting it, it will collapse by a kind of internal rot at the very heart of it. Babylonian culture is always a culture with no future. Her prosperity an illusion that relies more on the gaudy cosmetics of affluence than the tough muscles of moral fiber. She is doomed, says John. And I want you to notice at the beginning of chapter 19 that when eventually that doom does fall, heaven is happy about it. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. There are, I suppose, few of us who haven't been moved by that great Alleluia chorus in Handel's Messiah. We all know it. It's a wonderful piece of music. But I wonder how many of us are aware that in the Bible original, the Hallelujah chorus has two stanzas. Handel only wrote music to the second. You'll find that second stanza, of course, in um, verses 6 and 7 of Revelation 19. But the first stanza of the Alleluia Chorus in the Bible is a very uncongenial one to modern ears. I can see why Handel left it out. For it celebrates not the mercy of God, but his judgment. Hallelujah, he has condemned the great prostitute. True and just are his judgments. You know, we often quote the words of Jesus about uh, how there is joy in heaven over a sinner that repents, a wonderful verse. But what John is pointing us to here is that heaven rejoices as well in God's retribution upon a sinful world. Sometimes people talk to me as if judgment and hell and things like that were some huge embarrassment to God. That really we, we, we shouldn't talk about such things with any great degree of freedom because, uh, uh, well, it's not nice, is it? Well, I have to tell you, the witness of the Bible is that in the eyes of heaven, evil is repulsive in its ugliness and outrageous in its insolence. Heaven sees evil as something which deserves punishment. And John tells us here that heaven is glad when that judgment finally falls. When the long tail of the corruption and fallenness and brutality of our sinfulness finally reaches an end. Eternity will shed no tears over the collapse of Babylon, I promise you that. Nor will she entertain any nostalgia for her memory. In that sense, perhaps VE Day is a kind of helpful picture for us. Can you imagine Jews who went through the Holocaust being anything but jubilantly relieved at the fall of the Nazi regime? Of course they were. I don't think it's wrong to say, Alleluia, such an appalling tyranny has been broken. We say it maybe with tears in our eyes because we know the cost that that victory has, uh, has demanded. But the Alleluia is real. On VE Day, people were glad that that long war was over and over victoriously. And they had every right to be glad. Well, so John tells us on heaven's VE Day, heaven will be glad too. But at last, the saints and look forward to somewhere they will feel at home. And that brings us to the second city. Let's, let's turn from looking back from the watershed 
back to Babylon that has fallen, let's start looking forward to the other city, New Jerusalem. You notice that if uh, Babylon is depicted as a coarse and brazen prostitute, then John, the master of symbol, depicts Jerusalem as a chaste and beautiful bride. Look at chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a, vo a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Have you ever wondered what heaven's going to be like? And what do you think heaven's going to be like? I suspect you know that for many of us, this picture John gives to us of a city is a rather unexpected one. I mean, when most of us think about heaven, we aren't waiting for a city, are we? I mean, think of the cities you know. Think of Birmingham. I mean, do you honestly, can you honestly tell me you think that heaven will be like Birmingham? Does that make it an attractive prospect? There are many wonderful things about Birmingham. I've learned that, actually, the last few days. But I don't think I want to live in it for eternity. Is John serious? Most of us, when we think about going to heaven, think of flying around like angels, plucking harps of celestial gold while we float on ethereal cloud, don't we? That's the picture we have in our heads. A city, John. You mean people living together. You mean community. You mean social organization. You mean sort of material existence. You see, that is what John means. He doesn't throw away Babylon to reintroduce the Garden of Eden. It would have been very easy to do that, wouldn't it? To say, oh, when the, when the end of the world comes, we'll go right back to the beginning and have the Garden of Eden again, where we should have stayed, of course. It was Cain who started building cities after all, wasn't it? No, that isn't what he says. The trouble with many of us is that we've taken the hints which the Bible gives about the intermediate state in which Christians may be survived death and await the last day as a disembodied spirit. We've taken that intermediate state and turned it into a permanent and eternal state, as if existence as a kind of disembodied spirit were the best God had for us. No. The New Testament doctrine is not the immortality of the soul. The New Testament doctrine is the resurrection of the body. For it is a city that we wait for, a city in which we will dwell. A city, in some respects, like Babylon, only what Babylon should have been if it weren't for the sinfulness of mankind. It's a city, John sees, a marvelously splendid and extremely solid city. Pavements of transparent gold, he tells us in chapter, in verse 18, I think it is. Actually, speaking as a chemist, transparent gold is impossible, which suggests, I suppose, that the laws of nature are going to be rather different in the new heaven and the new earth, but then one would expect that. Walls studded with precious gems, too. Well, I suppose they'll be precious. I mean, if they're that common, one wonders what precious will mean. Every gate will be a single pearl. They must have very large oysters in heaven, mustn't they? <laughs> no, you see, it's all symbolism. People make such fools of themselves when they try to, to, to interpret this literally just as uh, John's dimensions of New, New Jerusalem, which make it sound like a vast sugar lump, 1,400 miles along each edge. That too is symbolism. 
John is using certain conventions of symbol and imagery, which he was familiar with, to try to communicate to us the glory of the unimaginable. But one thing John is quite convinced about, this new world is not an ethereal cloud. It's not even a revived Garden of Eden. It is a city. Indeed, I want you to notice where that city lands. I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the holy city descended out of heaven. You see the picture he gets here? There's a new world, a new heaven and a new earth, and this new city descends out of heaven and lands on the earth. The city is heavenly in origin, but it is earthly in its final location, which is what, of course, Jesus said. The meek shall inherit what? Second cloud on the right past Mars? No, the meek shall inherit the earth. This is our Christian hope. In so much contradiction, I think, to a lot of our popular ideas, it is a material, social, dare I say it, urban hope. Maybe living in Birmingham will give us more ideas about what heaven is like than you might think. Heaven is certainly gonna be a place of great cultural diversity, great ethnic diversity. Old racial and class rivalries are gonna be soothed into forgetfulness, we're told. It's going to be a glorious cosmopolitan harmony, a new kind of society, the city of God. Now, I stress this because I do think it's important. One of the reasons Christians in recent years have been rather weak in their concern on social issues is precisely down to this, that our ideas of heaven are too spiritual and ethereal. You know, George Bernard Shaw was a great uh, socialist, of course, not a Christian at all. And he complained about this in one of his plays. He says, heaven, as conventionally conceived, is a place so inane, so dull, so useless, so miserable, that nobody has ever ventured to describe a whole day in heaven, though plenty of people have described a day at the seaside. That was Shaw's complaint. He'd listened to too many Christians who weren't waiting for a city. Shaw was a passionate socialist. He was concerned for human fulfillment and dignity. Strumming a harp on some cloud had no appeal for him. That didn't answer the deep need of human beings for him. He'd rather go to Skegness or Blackpool any day. Who can blame him? No, we human beings need a worthwhile dream. And John gives it to us here. It is a city. Yes, like Babylon is a city, but this city is beautiful. And this city is good. Our Christian hope, you see, is an earthy hope, a new society where people are fulfilled in labor and in harmony with their neighbor. The only difference is that where Marx believed that we human, buildings, human beings could build that sort of new society with their own hands, John with a sure vision says no. The only city we build with our human hands is Babylon. This new Jerusalem must come down out of heaven. It doesn't evolve out of the flow of history. It is a new creation. But that doesn't mean there's anything ethereal about it. No, this glory is solid, it is substantial. It's a new earth. It's a city called New Jerusalem. So what's heaven going to be like? I suspect heaven is going to be more like the sort of life you're used to than maybe you think. John tells us it's going to be a place of consolation. Look again at those verses in 21. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. I'm quite sure on that first VE day, there must have been many people with personal sadness to bear. And even today, 50 years on, of course, I guess there are folk amongst us who have great grief to bear, things that make us weep. Illness in our bodies, maybe. Death that has separated us from those we love. 
This is our human lot in this world, in Babylon. But in New Jerusalem there will be no more death or mourning, no more crying or pain. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. A place of consolation. A place, too, of satisfaction. That is in verse 6. I will give the thirsty to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. One of the things I notice about many of the young people I deal with in Cambridge is that there is a certain emptiness in them. Many of them, of course, are very bright in Cambridge and have got brilliant careers ahead of them and they're going to earn a great deal of money. But it doesn't really satisfy them. Many of them will tell you they feel like they're caught in a rut. Some will say they're bored. Some will say they feel things are rather futile. Some actually seek to escape. There are lots of escapist things these days, aren't there? The television, the bottle, the holiday brochure, the Camelot lottery ticket. Jesus says the water of life, invigorating, exhilarating, satisfying, will be there in abundance for anyone who is thirsty. No one in heaven will ever be bored, I promise you that. It's a place of satisfaction. But I suppose supremely it is a place of goodness. A place where sin has once and for all been eliminated. And a place, therefore, where fellowship with God can be enjoyed without interruption. Do you see how that's described in chapter 22, verses 3 and 4? No longer will there be any curse. And because there's no longer any curse, the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. I guess many of us are looking forward to heaven because of the people we hope to meet there. I'm looking forward enormously to meeting the Apostle Paul. I've got quite a few questions I want him to clarify for me, <laughs> which have been frustrating me for a very long while. And of course, there are people too that we have lost, haven't we? Christian friends or loved ones that we long to meet again. And the great good news is that in the resurrection we shall meet them. And yet in that vast multitude of the redeemed, among all that sea of faces, there will be one face that will mean more to us than all the others put together. His face. The face of God, which is, of course, the face of Jesus. We shall see him as he is. They will see his face. It's a very beautiful picture of intimacy and fellowship, such as we Christians long to have, perhaps, in our quiet times, in our Bibles, in our prayer times, in our worship times. We long so much to come close to God in that way. But there are always things in the way, of course. We're living in Babylon, and there is a curse But in New Jerusalem, we shall see his face. John tries to use just about every metaphor and symbol he can lay his hands on to try and communicate the exquisite intimacy of this new experience of God. Back in chapter 21, verse 7, he uses the metaphor of parenthood. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. You go back to those... Um, that fantastic day in your childhood when you went for a walk with dad. That special exhilaration you felt that came from being together, belonging to one another. They're very important memories for those of us who have them, aren't they? Well, get hold of that memory. Get hold of that precious memory of being a son with a father, if you have it a child with a parent. Multiply it a thousand times and 
maybe you're getting near to what it will mean to know God in his new world. Or if that metaphor doesn't work for you, maybe because your family experience wasn't very happy, John has another one for you, one that actually controls large parts of chapter 21, the metaphor of matrimony. Look at verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. That's a lovely little touch there, actually. This angel, you know, back in the earlier chapters, has these bowls of wrath which he pours out on the earth. It's a terrifying picture. And here you see in chapter 21, uh, this angel has become a tourist guide. That's heaven for you, you see. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Some of us perhaps here who are married have some very profoundly tender memories in our minds of that relationship. Moments of a very delicate kind of joy that we've shared. Well, if there's anything like that in your memory, lay hold of it, recapture it, multiply it by a thousand. And then maybe you're getting somewhere near what it will mean to know God in this new Jerusalem. Or if still that isn't appropriate for you, there's one more metaphor John will try in chapter 22, verse 3. Not parenthood, not matrimony this time, but service. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Do you ever remember, did you ever have that experience at school of um, being asked to run an errand by the headmaster? I remember it happened to me once. And uh, when I got back, you know, and had done the errand correctly, he sort of singled you out and looked straight at you and said, well done, that was good. Those sort of memories do stick in the brain, don't they? Or maybe you had that experience, as again I can remember when I was a kid, of the Duke of Edinburgh coming to my school shaking hands with us all, you know, saying, well done, you got your Duke of Edinburgh award, and things like that. The sort of bounce in your step, the excitement you felt that you were shaking hands with the Duke of Edinburgh. Well, if you've got any sort of memory like that, multiply it by a thousand, the warmth of that moment and the excitement of that moment and the honor of that moment. And you'll be getting close, maybe, to having some idea of what it will mean to know God in his new world. It will be like belonging to a family. It will be like being married in a way far above any marriage any of us have ever experienced. It will be like serving a great king. And this, says John, not for some brief audience that God's people can be granted every now and again, they're going to live in the conscious experience of God's presence and bask in it as the warmth of the sun. That's the picture he gives us. This is the happiness they share. They will see his face. You know, I've scanned all the books I've got to try and find anybody who's given a description of heaven that comes anywhere close to doing it justice. And the only one I can find that really helps me, and I'll, I'll read it to you now, is from C.S. Lewis's Narnia books. He has a, um, a paragraph at the end that, that, that I think captures something anyway. It goes like this. The things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. For us, this is the end of all stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has ever read and which goes on forever and in which every chapter is better than the one before. Do you know why I think Christians should stand out in our modern world? 
oh, no doubt Christians ought to stand out for the moral quality of their lives. Certainly true. Christians should stand out for the, for the courage of their witness. Certainly true. But I suspect, you know, as this world grows weary and old, as the culture of Babylon comes more and more to characterize our world, and Christian people feel more and more out of sync with the value system around them as a result, I suspect the thing that will mark out Christians more than anything else will be that they are people of hope transcendent hope. See, there is no hope in Babylon, except maybe the hope of a little bit more profit next month than last. Perhaps a slightly bigger house we might buy next year, or a slightly better car. That's the, that's the furthest hope goes in Babylon. Maybe our premium bond will come up. Wonder of wonders. How happy that will make us. Now, the only people who have any real hope in this world are the people who believe in New Jerusalem and wait for it. In the year 410, the day which the Christians had been waiting for ever since John penned this book came to pass. In the year 410 AD, the city of Rome fell. Suddenly, unexpectedly, a mass of barbarians seized Rome and sacked her and burned her. And the news of that shocked the entire world. It was the end of civilization as they knew it. For it was a world in many respects uncannily like ours, with family breakdowns and escapist entertainments and obsessive sex and violence. It was a world just as John has portrayed here, full of affluence and wealth and comfort and self-indulgent luxury. And it fell, just like that. In North Africa, there was a great Christian bishop, Augustine, a man with a mind like a planet, but a great man of God too. Augustine heard the news. It traveled fast. His congregation were completely thrown into disarray. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to the world? Rome has fallen. Is this the end? Augustine stood up that Sunday morning and preached a sermon. He likens the fall of Rome to the destruction of Sodom in that sermon. And he told his congregation that on no account must they lose hope. There will be an end to every earthly kingdom, he told them. For this world is passing away. This world is short of breath. But do not fear. Your youth will be renewed like the eagles. Those were his words. And as some of you may know, he spent the remaining 17 years of his life writing what many regard as his greatest book. It is called The City of God. It's a book about that city which, unlike Rome, can never pass away. Now, I really think it's true. As the 21st century dawns, the thing that's going to characterize us Christians more than anything else is our hope. Do make sure you've got some. If you're lacking any, well, the last chapters of Revelation are a good place to begin. Let's pray together. Father, we know there are some people who are so heavenly minded they're no earthly use and we don't want to be like that. But Lord, we really do believe that the nature of our hope 
shapes the kind of lives we live and the kind of values we have and the kind of goals we pursue. So, Lord, we pray tonight that you would fill our minds with this great and glorious hope of the city of God and teach us what it means, Lord, day by day to live our lives in a way that prepares for that city and sets up signposts to that city, points people to that city. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing a closing song.